Hey, this is Kirk Quarte, and in this week's Atlantic edition of Forerunners, the Surfline podcast, lead forecaster Mike Watson and I will tackle a variety of topics related to the tropics. Tropical Cyclone Harold kicks things off. We will quickly get into the impacts of El Nino and La Nina on tropical development in the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific. After the eight-minute mark, we follow that with a discussion of Colorado State's early season prediction that dropped within the past week. Just before the 16-minute mark, Mike and I will then discuss some memorable hurricanes from the past from the perspective as both surfers and forecasters. At around the 29-minute mark, we wrap up the pod with a few things that we're working on related to the tropics that will be dropping on Surfline in the coming weeks. Now it's time for the shameless plug. If you aren't already a premium member and would like to give us a try, we would greatly appreciate it. Just go to surfline.com forward slash forerunners podcast for a free 15-day trial of Surfline Premium. All right, here we go. Okay, this is Sean Collins, uh, Chief Forecaster of Surfline, and this is, you know, the first order of business looking down on the Southern Hemisphere, what to expect over the next uh, two weeks. At any given moment, a perfect wave is breaking somewhere on this Earth. For the surfer, the trick has always been knowing where and when to find it. All right, Mike, let's hop right into this. We're talking tropical cyclones with lead forecaster Mike Watson. And uh, you know, one of the big things that we're looking at globally right now is we have Harold that's over there uh, near Fiji, a really strong tropical cyclone. I think earlier it peaked as a Category 4, Category 5. Uh, that's kind of the, the big story globally as far as tropical cyclones are concerned. But another thing that uh, was interesting that hit our plate over the past week or so was the uh, spring uh, forecast for the 2020 North Atlantic tropical cyclone season from Colorado State University. Mike, you know a little bit about tropical cyclones. What, uh, what was your take on that? And what are we looking at here as we head uh, into the tropic season? Um, yeah, well, we, we, we had Harold uh, uh, pass through and impacted Vanuatu, and we were we were monitoring that, just, just hoping it would you know spare some of the other islands. And um, looks like the big island of Fiji was, was, wasn't impacted too much too hard by Harold, but, uh, yeah, that was, uh, one thing we've been watching. Um, and, and the tropics are on our radar. I mean, we, we look at the season starting uh, in the Pacific, we're, we're just a little over a month away from the start of the Eastern Pacific season. And then we, um, of course, which is May 15th. Yes. Which is May 15th starts the Eastern Pacific season. We start a couple uh, weeks later here in the Atlantic. So, you know, we're looking ahead to that. Um, you know, it's just one of our realities with even with everything going on is, is, you know, we're, we're entering that season. Um, you know, thankfully, typically, you know, the early part of the season is, is usually pretty quiet over here, uh, on the Atlantic side. We, we, we tend to see that kind of early season, whether it's a disturbance or a weaker tropical system, uh, take shape somewhere. Boy, it seems like it's been happening earlier and earlier every year. I mean, wouldn't you say, um, it, it's like, we uh, would almost see these like around early June, but it seems like we've seen these, I mean, call me crazy, but like something in early May um, in there. Yeah, and a lot of times what, what we get there is you kind of have those fronts that, that will sag down and kind of stall out over you know the Gulf of Mexico or right off the southeastern U.S. coastline or Florida. And you can kind of, you know, right now our water is pretty warm and you can get something to spin up, whether that's fully tropical or subtropical. Um, you know, as far as we're concerned, a lot of times it doesn't really matter too much. but. Um, yeah, the, it does seem like I, I, I'm trying to rack my brain. I feel like there was three out of the past four or four out of the past six or something like that as far as early season, um, you know, pre-June 1st developments. So it does seem like those are, are happening um, a little more frequently here over the past you know decade or so. Yeah, it, it, it does. And, and, you know, so, of course, we're, we're going to be on the lookout again for, for potential early season stuff. But um. Yeah, you know, when we when we're looking and, and one of the main things we, we always want to look at is is what is the forecast for, for El Nino um over in the eastern Pacific and or in the in the Pacific waters. And um, you know, we basically have um, you know, uh, well the first thing is what is El Nino? And that's just a periodic warming of the uh, waters along the South American coast through the equatorial Pacific region. Um this alters our, you know, global weather patterns everywhere. Um, uh, and, and, and how this impacts the season is, is when this happens, when we see these warmer waters, well, it effectively, uh, puts a lid on our season over here. So 
El Nino is kind of good for lesser tropical activity. From a swell surf perspective, well, lesser tropical activity tends to result in and can result in some slower summers um, uh, out there. But we look to the opposite side. The flip side of that's La Nina, and that's the periodic cooling, um, you know, opposite of El Nino. And when we see that, this effectively puts a lid on uh, eastern uh, Pacific tropical cyclones. And what ends up happening is over the Atlantic, we see, uh, you know, changes in these global circulation patterns. And, and then the Atlantic becomes more favorable for this upward rising motion. Um, and that's what we need. We, it's one of the ingredients we need. We, this upward rising motion is enhanced over the Atlantic. So that gives, you know, more opportunity for, for, for storms, precursor storms to develop and the seeds of, of our tropical cyclones. It also d- reduces our vertical wind shear um, out there. And the vertical wind shear, as we know, is the, the, the upper level winds can rip storms apart. And that's what we see during the warm El Nino. La Nina, the opposite pattern emerges and we see diminished uh, upper level wind shear, enhanced upward motion. And so those La Nina years uh, can set up some of our busiest uh, cyclone years. So um, really, that's really the first thing we, we, we look at. What is the forecast for that? Um, but uh, as you know, is, is the forecast through this time of year for El Nino or La Nina uh, can be a little muddled, um, you know, call that the spring barrier. Um, so uh, right now, uh, the latest forecasts, we're, we are seeing some warming. We've seen some warming that's been in place over the equatorial Pacific through the winter months. Um, not quite an El Nino, but like a neutral El Nino, uh, warmer, uh, a little bit warmer waters out there uh, than normal, but not quite what is classified as a typical El Nino. And um, looking at some of the latest data, some of these subsurface water temps um, are showing still some some warmer than normal waters under there. So we do expect a little bit of this, of this to um, either maintain where we're at um, and, and, and support uh, continued a little bit warmer than normal waters there heading into the start of the uh, Eastern Pacific season. Um, so we could see uh, some early season activity in that region. Um, moving over to the Atlantic side, we're, you know, likely going to be again, starting out, uh, uh, um, small, uh, starting out quieter than normal, but, uh, things could get interesting later on in the season. Um, some of the forecasts for El Nino show us tend- trending to a more neutral to even more of a cooler signal, uh, La Nina neutral. Um, there are a couple outlier models that are suggesting a, a pretty decent La Nina, during the peak of our tropical season. So um, again, we can't make decisions on just a couple of models. There's a, there's a bunch of them out there, but it's, you know, it's just worth noting that there's a couple of these, you know, out there uh, suggesting that um, in there. So um, yeah, things could get interesting, uh, especially, uh, especially considering what we've seen over the last couple of years and, and especially considering the, the, the time we're in right now um, with the pandemic. It was, um, you know, pretty eye-opening, I think, when I, I saw the numbers from Colorado State. Uh, it seems like a lot of times, especially in their spring outlooks, they tend to be um, a little restrained, I guess, um, you know, when uh, when it comes to maybe going, you know, way above average or way below average. But when I saw some of the numbers um, uh, from the Colorado State group, I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, you know, down in yes. Florida, and, I mean, heck, between Florida and the Outer Banks, I mean, gosh. I mean, how many yeah. years in a row have we been impacted? Absolutely. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I was like, oh, great. <laughs> I know, and, and I and I see them, and it and it is just one forecast, but you know, it's it's kind of our starting point of where we, you know, here's where we're starting from, and you know, they'll issue more forecasts coming on through the season, um, but you know, right now we're we're they're going above average. Um, we've already have. Uh, name storms, they're forecasting 16. Uh, we, we, on average, we see a little more than 12 per season. And, and that doesn't really tell us much, right? Uh, 16 name storms, if none of them reach hurricane force, you know. Um, okay. Or way over there by the Azores or something. Yeah, it doesn't, right. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean too much to us. Right. Surf-wise. Yep. So we, um, you know, we start, you know, digging in a little further and, 
And uh, they're forecasting four major hurricanes versus an average of around 2.7 per year um, of major hurricanes. And then one thing we look at is accumulated cyclone energy. And this just gives you a better measure, a better quantitative measure of a storm um, out there. And typically we see 106 ACE units on average uh, per season. And the forecast is for 150 um, ACE units this season. So that's telling us 40% busier than average um, uh, out there. So it's, yeah, it's kind of eye opening right now. Um, and, and to compare that, that's, that's higher than what we saw in 2019, 2019, we saw an above normal season, 131 ACE units. Uh, same thing in 2018, above normal, 132 ACE units, uh, 2017 hyperactive, 224 ACE units. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at. Um, when we measure these things, um, uh, it's a, just a just a far better measure than than just the number of storms. Um, number of storms is just a starting point, but uh, yeah, this 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 ace really quantifies uh, things more wholly, um, you know, out there. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't know about you. I'm a little um, weary of. I'm, I, I guess I'm well trained now to to you know we can grab our stuff and go. You know, being right here on the coast of Florida, um, probably not much more than a than a than a long drive from the edge of the water here. So it, you know, but uh, we're, you know, we're well-trained on, on our hurricane preparedness plan and, and, and leaving, but uh, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little over the drill <laughs> as I'm sure many residents along the Eastern seaboard are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, I mean, you know, down, I think about last year, you know, hurricane, hurricane Dorian, um, you know, with it knocking on your door and John Jonathan Warren's door down there in Florida, and then came up, you know, kind of towards us and just just whacked Ocracoke Island. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it 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 was uh, just devastating down there. And then, you know, just around when they opened back up uh, for tourism and stuff, then you know, then we have the pandemic deal happen. So. Um, kind of can't catch a break. And, you know, obviously the tourism based industry here, you're going to, you know, see how long we continue on with the current trajectory of, of stuff, but you got to think there's going to be some significant impacts to that here as we head into the summer months. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, we talked about the number of name storms and ACE and all that, but you know, it, it does definitely just take one. I think, you know, we were talking about 1992, yes. um, slow season, um, uh, I, I guess we didn't even have our A storm until sometime in August, right? And uh, it ended up being kind of a memorable one. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. That was uh, Hurricane Andrew. We had a below normal season um, in 1992, and and everyone, I, I don't think anyone, no one here in Florida has forgotten Andrew. Um, yeah, that was, uh, you know, it one thing that's 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 kind of interesting with that is you know you know formed during an El Nino year it I mean it just slammed Miami devastated Homestead Florida um, and initially when the storm made landfall you know Andrew was rated as a Category Four storm um, but what they do you know we get the, the, the National Hurricane Center they get this this data in real time and they they do their best to you know get things down. But after every season, they go back and reanalyze every single storm. And, um, turns out that, that, uh, hurricane Andrew, uh, became a, was, was upgraded to a category five, um, before making landfall there near Homestead, Florida. So, I mean, yeah, that's just something that no one will ever forget. We, it really helps set the standard on building codes here in Florida. Um, just the widespread damage there just really, uh, you know, brought about that. And, and, you know, now we have building codes, um, as a basis, you know, Andrew was, was a basis for that, um, in, in creating some of these stringent building codes that we see throughout the state. And I, and and I'm not sure if up in your area, if it impacted there, but, um, you know, certainly here, um, it has, um, and I will say if, if you're, you know, like a student or, uh, you know, a young person that's, or even heck, if you're just interested in weather and kind of like nerding out on that kind of stuff, you can go back and find those, uh, those seasonal recaps that the hurricane center produces after each season. And there's, you know, plenty of stuff for you to read in there. That's really interesting. If, if this stuff kind of gets you excited and you're, 
you've run through your Netflix list of shows and you're, you're ready to, um, you know, find something else to read or whatever. Uh, there's definitely some, some really interesting stuff in those. And, um, I can't remember, you know, I was still pretty young in 92. I was, uh, nine years old. And, um, but I, I do remember, you know, I think the big ones up here were, um, we had Bertha and Fran and then Floyd was, a, was a big one. And then obviously Isabel for us. Um, so those were kind of, you know, within a relatively, I think within eight years of each other. And, um, I think that kind of really got, you know, not uh, our flood insurance stuff or, our wind and hail insurance and all that kind of just <laughs> went kind of through the roof after all that. Um, and I'm sure the building codes changed as well um, during, during that time frame, but probably not as stringent as what, what happened after uh, Andrew in, in Florida. Um, but what's up? Uh, let's, let's talk about something better. Let's talk about well, surf a little bit. Let's talk about, <laughs> about like, give me, let, let me ask you um, if you could draw up a swell, you know, and like, or let's, let's go back and say, What's a scenario of uh, something that produces great waves for, for Florida? You know, give me, give me a storm, maybe, you know, one that's in your memory of, of uh, ones that, that really gave great waves and, and didn't wallop anybody. <laughs> um, boy, um, you know, there's, there's a few out there. I, there's a couple I, I, I recall that I go back to. Um, some some live in my mind because of forecasting purposes, and one was uh, Bertha. I believe it was like two thousand seven or eight um, out there, and I re- I recall Bertha was was a was a classic. I don't say it's a classic case, but you know, back at that time, we you know, there's a lot of research just starting on rapid intensification of storms and, and what are these ingredients needed, and and it was still kind of a really unknown, um, very young. Uh, type of uh, um, area in hurricane research. Have and, you ever heard anything called maximum potential intensity, Mike? <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> yes, I have. I did a lot of I did a work on maximum potential intensity, and that's that's based off uh, uh, Carrie Emanuel's work at MIT. Um, but you know, basically, that just takes a sea surface temperature, an atmospheric profile, and says here, based under these conditions, this is the upper threshold of a storm's uh, intensity. So yeah, we do look at those MPI maps, but we have times where, you know, it was interesting. Well, the question was for my advisor, well, why, why do storms sometimes exceed their MPI? Um, so some of these things were, were, were brought to, you know, why does this occur? Um, and it doesn't occur that often, but it does, or why do storms not reach it? Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's still some unanswered questions there to this day um, with that. And, and, and if you are interested in that, if you do a little bit of Google searching for Mike, you can find 99 pages of fun like I just did. You can read <laughs> what he has to say about, yeah. about MPI. I, I, you know, and, and it, that's something that's kind of, I, I, I would, I would love to have taken it further. I mean, we can, you know, to construct a climatological MPI set, um, a data set out there, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it really, it really opened my eyes and and that time to an earlier thinking of, well, you know, that it does not just what happens at the surface, the water temp at the surface, but, you know, why do category five storms typically occur in, in only certain areas? And, you know, at that time I thought, well, you know, you, you got to look beneath the ocean and, 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 and look down. What's the, you know, if a storm, is, is, as we know, is traveling over the ocean, it's going to cause some upwelling and it upwells cooler waters. Well, that's going to impact the intensity of a storm. But what if it's in an area where this, where it's upwelling, but the upwelling is more and more warm water. And, and that's one of the things we found is, is a lot of these category five storms were occurring over areas of the um, Atlantic where we had the deepest pools of warm water, which are mainly the Caribbean. And, and as you, as you track across the Atlantic, that, that warm pool of water um, becomes deeper and deeper as you head to our side of the basin. So, um, you know, gives rise to why we've seen these strongest storms in, in, in some of these areas, you know, over here. And, and that has been incorporated since then into, you know, not my work, but those other guys doing, you know, work on this and, and incorporating oceanic heat content, um, which is that 
that kind of that total of, of available heat energy for, for tropical cyclones in there um, has been incorporated into these models. Um, you know, mainly one of the main ones that I, I like to look at and use is the ship's model. It's a statistical hurricane intensity predictor system. Um, and uh, yeah, they incorporate that in there. So there's a lot going on with these things. There's still a lot we don't know. Um, don't you like when an acronym just works? It, I know. <laughs> I, these guys, yeah. I, I wonder how long sometimes they take to to come up with the right acronym. You know, if they get a bottle of tequila or some or a couple pints of beer, and they're like, "All right, how do we make this fit?" You know, <laughs> they just do. I just some reason it works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh. uh you know, getting back is is Bertha was one that that was interesting. Is is the forecast we're calling for? I mean, literally about need a waist high surf. We we had, you know, the wave models have since improved since this time frame. But um, you know, I I vividly recall I did a hand calculation on that. It was said two to three foot. I you know I went it's like man, it's going to be head high and probably some overhead surf and um and it was far enough offshore it underwent rapid intensification. So I had to kind of construct my own wind field, um, and fetch and everything. And, and then I uh, went from there and, and calculated it out. And, um, yeah, it was really fun, uh, really fun surf. Uh, it was, it was pretty, you know, look for, for that time of year, I believe it was July. It was, it was pumping. It was, you know, it was really fun. Um, right around, uh, it was right around July 4th. Yeah. Yep. So um, I remember I was, was doing an animal. A, you were in where? Oh, you were in Panama. I was in Panama. Okay. Yeah, I went, yeah, so I missed it. Yeah, so I uh <laughs> I uh I was doing a, a presentation, a surfline presentation, I recall in Daytona Beach at the Board and Waves Expo and we had quite a uh quite a fun time out back after that. A lot of guys uh, from that were were surfing out back um uh during that time and, and yeah, it was pretty pretty fun time, pretty special to, to do that and then hang with some of the guys from here. Um, I recall Ron Long, Glenn Klugel, we were all paddling out. Um, I think Ricky Carroll was out there. Uh, Drew Brophy was, I, I remember him vividly. Uh, I didn't, I, I just met him. I didn't, you know, I didn't know, but I remember him on a, on a stand up paddleboard and dropping into a wave and just, you know, just the stoke level was pretty fun. Um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of a, that was a special swell and, um, and, and just the vibe was, was real fun um, with everyone there. Um, yeah. So that, that's one that's in the memory banks, um, for sure. And I'll, I'll actually do another one in 2008. Um, uh, for me up here, it was, uh, Hurricane Hannah. Ooh, um, yeah. That was a good one. Yes. Uh, we had, I'm actually, I, I'm in my office at my house right now and, um, I have a, uh, a sequence of me getting a, uh, a little, little cover up at S turns. I surfed, uh, I just remember the watercolor and, uh, the conditions and, and, uh, gosh, it was just, just the great direction of the sand at S turns back then. It was before they moved the house and, uh, the Knights were at Anthony house and it was just so good. And it was just the right size, you know, just a little yeah. bit overhead and in the right um, period, right? Right period. Yeah. And the, mm-hmm. the direction was enough of a Southeast that it, it was hitting, you know, not kind of square on and, um, that was just a really memorable day. Uh, and I remember I was surfing with a couple of friends here and I was working that day and I was like, man, I, I, I can't, I can't get out. Like I gotta, I gotta keep surfing. And, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, and I remember coming home and I was like, oh gosh, I got all, and you know, obviously yeah. Yeah, things were very, you know, very active when you have a hurricane. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, so I had to crank out all, and I think that was maybe back in the day when we would do the whole East Coast. Yeah. Um, you know, there was our, two our of us covering out. a lot of ground. <laughs> yeah, there was. Um, and uh, I just remember coming back and being like, okay, you're going to concentrate and knock this out. But I was so tired. I'd surf like five or six hours. And, um, but man, it was so good. It was so good. Just the direction, like all the combination, the period, the direction, the size, the sand, the wind. Um, you know, it was uh, definitely a magical day. I was, you know, 12 years ago now. And I, I think about it yep. once a week. <laughs> I, I, you know, I can't believe I actually didn't, I didn't recall that because that was about a month in a half before my first daughter was born or before my first child was born, my, my only daughter. Um, but my first child was born and, and yeah, I do remember that day vividly. I, I lived, um, up the road from where I do now. And, and I remember I was, 
you knew the surf was going to get good. It was passing by here and we were waiting for the offshore winds and, and they had settled in. It was pretty big. Um, but my next door neighbor and, and good friend, Demas Jones was, he was, uh, he, he kept, you know, coming over the house and knocking on the door and, and he's just literally jumping out of his skin and, and come on, Watson, let's go. We got to go down the inlet. We got to go down to the inlet. You know, we let's go. And, and, you know, I'm, 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 Hey, well, you know, let's take our time. We, we have some time, you know, and I wanted to get a lot of the work knocked out. And I remember it was about one or two o'clock when, um, in the afternoon when I said, all right, let's, you know, let's go. And, and I remember pulling up to Spanish house and it was really crowded. Um, a lot of guys out. And, um, I recall watching Johnny Ode, who's a longtime well-known local here, uh, Sebastian Inlet local, Melbourne beach guy. I uh, just drop it in onto this, to this wave. It was I mean, just way overhead and, uh, fully barreled and, and just, just spit out. And, you know, Johnny's not a guy to claim things. He just boom out, out the back. And we were just, holy cow. <laughs> you know, we were out of, like, whoa. Um, but it was packed. It was so packed. So we said, there's like, there's no one at the inlet. We went to the inlet, nobody out. There was four guys walking down the beach. Um, they, it looks, it looks like they'd try to paddle out or something, walking down the beach, nobody out. Me and Demas get there, and then uh, Robert Roman, uh, Bob Roman's son, uh, showed up with a with a friend from Satellite Beach, and and it was just pumping. I mean, it was it was it had to be three four feet overhead, um, just peaky barrels, perfect, uh, um, just the perfect everything. And we paddled out uh, us four. We we're the first four guys out, um, and I just remember I just remember dropping in and, and just getting barreled and going. <laughs> I, I couldn't even. I couldn't even believe it. I got the first one, you know, I was a little nervous, you know, it's like, you know, you, you're, you're, you haven't, you know, seen surf like that all summer. So you're a little bit, you know, trying to get the feet back in the, get the feet, the, the sea legs back on, so to speak. And yeah, I remember that day vividly. I remember Robert, um, you know, who, who unfortunately passed is just a phenomenal surfer, but I remember seeing him that day. Um, that's the first day I'd met him, um, and surfed with him and, and getting some really good waves. Um, you know, that day. I and, can picture you paddling. I can picture you, you know, chin into the board. Oh yeah. Just struck. <laughs> just chin it. down, man. I had dents what, in my board where the chins were. And, and, and I remember that, man. I yeah. remember the first time I met you, I was like, we were going surfing. I was like, what, what's going on with your board right there? Like, why do you have all these little divots? Actually, uh, didn't bat, didn't bat like start putting patches and stuff on there for you? <laughs> you don't want to know what he said. He's like, what the hell are you doing down there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did, man. I, I, I mean, that's just the way I was after it and, and just kind of the way I was taught too. you know, from a lot of these guys that, you know, oh boy, they, they'd get after you. If you missed a wave, if you surf the inlet, you know, back in, you know, in the eighties and, and, and what have you, if you paddle for a wave and missed it, you, you better not do that. Um, cause you're going to hear about it. Um, and so that kind of, you know, that was burned into my you know brain is, you know, when you're out here, every wave's a gift. Um, and, and, you know, if you're paddling for it and you're going to take that off somebody, you, you better make it, um, you better make it count. Um, yeah, you're going to hear about it. And, and that's really kind of why that put my head down and, and dig in. (laughs) Um, but that was a really special day. And I remember the next day going to birthing class with my wife, which I, which I did to, you know, she was doing what turned out to be a month and a half and, and just being so calm and so relaxed. And, um, yeah, that day's burned into my memory just because of the whole situation there with the, with the surf, um, you know, the guys I surfed with, you know, we were some of the first guys out there before the, before Spanish house moved down to the inlet. Um, yeah, it was definitely a special day. Um, and one I won't, I won't ever forget, um, you know, by any, by any means. So, so, so to circle back here, we'll, uh, uh, chat uh, a little bit. What what are we doing at Surfline um, leading up to the tropical season? I, I know you've been working on um, uh, some things. So w- what do we have in the pipeline that people can look out for? And uh, and then what are you? What's your ger- you know your general take on the season? Uh, what do you think is going to going to shake out? Well, I you know right now working on an early season outlook. Um, we're going to talk a bit about that you know Colorado State forecast in there. Um, just like I mentioned here, just some of the factors we're looking at right now. Um, on what the expect expectation is. Is it going to be normal, busier than normal or what have you? And yeah, so we'll get into that a bit. And, and some of the factors will break off, you know, 
El Nino again is a bigger is a bigger one. So in conjunction with that, we want to you know get that out there as an explainer of you know uh, of exactly why um, uh, El Nino you know diminishes our activity and enhances East Pack activity, and why La Nina. Uh, diminishes Eastern pack activity, but enhances ours. So we'll get, you know, into a little bit of the nuts and bolts there in, um, in, um, in, in um, layman's terms and, and bring that in and, and, you know, discuss some of that. And then the Colorado forecast that's coming out. And then of course, you know, it's just our starting point. We need to continually monitor these things as we go. There's not a, you know, you put this forecast out. Okay. That's not, you know, that that's it. That's what it's going to be. It's, it's no, this is just our guidebook. We're just setting up the guide, you know, it's one of our tools as we as we step through and gives us a starting point, you know, of, of, of where to go. Where do we go from here? And we'll continue to monitor that, monitor water temps um, across both the Atlantic and and how things are evolving in the Pacific. And and then with that, too, we'll bring in some other factors that impact us while we're during, you know, while we're in the heat, in the heart of the season. So we have some some climate signals that we need to watch. Uh, on the subseasonal scale that come through and we'll, you know, over the next uh, several weeks or months, we'll, we'll bring some of those out and what to watch for as well. Um, the interesting thing we are seeing is, is one of the outlier models that is calling for a stronger La Nina. Um, when we look at the shear forecast for August from that model, you know, we're seeing in August into September, as one would expect, if it's forecasting a stronger La Nina, well, it's forecasting a favorable shear environment for storm formation over the Atlantic waters. So just something we're going to watch out for. A couple of things I've also been watching in there, which has been pretty interesting, is at the same time, while it's showing some favorable shear patterns over the Atlantic waters, well, occasionally what crops up in, in August is we're seeing areas of higher unfavorable shear near the coastlines, um, the Gulf and the, and the, and the Eastern seaboard coastline. So kind of hard to read too much into that right now, but, um, you know, those kinds of setups, while it's favorable out over the Atlantic for storm formation, you know, sometimes if we see this kind of pattern set up, it can act as sort of a, a barrier, um, uh, in there. But when we look at September, we, we've, we've kind of gone away from that signal, um, so and that's the, as you know, the early part of September is our, our peak, peak season, peak time of season. And, and, uh, just to give a little bit of a, a tidbit in here from the Colorado state, uh, forecast, the entire continental U S coastline, uh, the probability, pr- probability for at least one major hurricane landfall on one of the coastal areas for the entire continental U S is right now at 69% in their forecast. But the average over the last century is 52 percent so we're, we're we're above that mark um, in the forecast right now so just something to be prepared for um, at the end of the day that's all you can do sounds good thanks Mike appreciate it get to those forecasts thanks absolutely and uh, great chatting with you and um, just uh, stay healthy hope everyone out there's uh, staying healthy and and staying sane Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Forerunners, the Surfline podcast. The next Atlantic version will be available Wednesday evening, April the 15th, while the next Pacific podcast will be next Tuesday evening, April the 14th. If you aren't already a premium member and would like to give us a try, we would greatly appreciate it. Just go to surfline.com forward slash Forerunners podcast for a free 15-day trial of Surfline Premium. Stay safe, be good to each other, and shred at home. Thanks for listening.